Hello everybody and welcome to this video lecture on Elizabeth Gaskell's novel Mary Barton. Alright, so the best way to do this video is for you to go into the Mary Barton module and open up the slideshow I have. It should be titled Elizabeth Gaskell Mary Barton. Um, open that up because I'm going to be talking to the camera basically is all I'm going to be doing for the video. So if you're following along with that slideshow you can probably have an easier time of understanding what I'm talking about and you probably won't be as bored either. So I will pause for a second while you pause the video and then go get that slideshow if you haven't done so already. And once you have it opened up, go ahead and hit the play button again. All right, we're back. All right, so I'm going to be following along with this as well with you. So let's go to slide number two on that, which talks about the debate over industrialism. Now, the thing to remember about the Industrial Revolution is it was a major turning point in human history. The world changed forever as a result of the Industrial Revolution. What the Industrial Revolution was, was it was a change from kind of an agrarian, self-sufficient uh, type of lifestyle to one where uh, people became consumers. And you hear that today. You hear about the consumer index and you hear about uh, this being a consumer economy. Uh, our economy and the economy of just about every major economy around the world is healthy when there are people out spending money to buy goods and services. And when people are not spending money to buy goods and services, then the economy, regardless of what country you're talking about, is considered to be a little unhealthy. Now, of course, that's an oversimplification. There are lots of things that go into uh, whether an economy is healthy or not. But consumer spending in a consumer-based economy like ours is probably the main thing. Um, because of the Industrial Revolution, we no longer have to grow our own food. We no longer have to uh, make our own clothes. We no longer have to build our own furniture. Uh, as a result of the Industrial Revolution and the industrialization that came with that, uh, we now, if we need something to eat, can go to the grocery store and buy it. Or the clothing store to buy clothing if we need to buy some you know, new threads, if you will. Um, so, we actually, uh, all of this came about through the Industrial Revolution. I would also argue that the Industrial Revolution is called a revolution because it was painful in many ways. Uh, you know, people suffered during the early years of industrialism, and at times, uh, in some countries of the world where they have sweatshops, people still suffer, uh, working for pennies a day while their bosses make millions of dollars a year. So, um, to a certain extent, there's a suffering, but really it's a revolution because it changed everything. Our world will never, ever go back to a pre-industrial time. So there is some debate going on. It was going on then, and it still goes on now. So we look at this debate over industrialism. Uh, industrialism as a blessing. First of all, it improved the quality of life in many Britons. And in the United States, we still make that uh, argument today. Uh, for many people who were able to afford to buy the goods that were being produced in the factories, the quality of their lives got better. They didn't have to make their own things. Usually these factories produce good quality uh, products. And so uh, people had more leisure time now because of it. So really the improvement in the quality of the life of many Britons was improved through industrialism. Uh, there is extreme, extreme growth in the British national economy. So people who look at national economic numbers, things like gross domestic product uh, or whatever other measurements you want to use, the numbers were just absolutely phenomenal during the Industrial Revolution most years. Now there were some depressions, uh, one of the most famous being somewhere around 1932, or I'm sorry, 1832, not 1932, 1832. But um, for the most part, when people looked at the numbers, uh, there was more wealth in Britain at that time than there ever had been prior to that. And then there were jobs for many people who would otherwise be starving to death. And let's think about uh, what politicians say today. Uh, most politicians today are going to run on a platform of I'm going to create new jobs. Jobs is the biggest buzzword going on in American politics right now. You can see that during the Industrial Revolution, that was the, the same rallying cry. Produce jobs. Uh, people open up factories, people get put to work. Now instead of starving to death in the streets, they can actually go work on a loom or they can go work uh, doing whatever job is necessary, turning a wrench or whatever and they will be able to make a little wage which they can then buy food with and go live in shelters with and whatever. All right. But there's a flip side to all of this and this is where the industrialism as a curse comes in. Uh, the rich got richer off the blood, sweat, and tears of the working class. Uh, we still hear about income disparity today. Uh, this is nothing new. This was going on in the 1800s as well. 
In fact, if you uh, once you read Mary Barton, you will see that John Barton is very upset because the rich uh, seem to be immune to any downturns in the economy. The rich can spend money lavishly. The rich will always be rich in his opinion, regardless of what happens. But the poor factory hands, if a factory closes, they will die of starvation or they will die of sickness because they can't get the medicine or they're not eating properly or whatever. So um, there was a huge, huge gap between the haves and the have-nots, and that was uh, considered a curse of industrialism. Frowned and unsanitary living conditions in the large industrial cities. Um, Mary Barton doesn't touch on that a whole lot, but it does a little bit. Uh, remember the lady that lives in the uh, basement. Living in a basement was bad because all the filth and dirt from the floors above you would end up coming down into your little uh, basement place. Um, again, Mary Barton doesn't quite do this as extremely as some other books do, but uh, the fact that people were living in their own filth or their neighbor's filth, um, surrounded by rats and bugs and what, you, what have you, uh, was really a problem uh, during, during the Industrial Revolution. And we still hear about slum lords today. Uh, then the horrors of child labor. That will not appear at all in uh, Mary Barton, but uh, children were being put to work as early as five years old, uh, especially in the mines and the factories, because there were certain things children could do that the larger uh, full-grown adults could not fit into these places or they could not do the work. So uh, the horrors of child labor, which we're not going to discuss this semester, but uh, you should look into it sometime and see um, how many children died on the job from the horrible working conditions that they had. Alright, so what caused the Industrial Revolution? Why was there an Industrial Revolution in the first place? Well, uh, it was a perfect storm really. A lot of things came together to cause the Industrial Revolution to happen. The first was the technological innovations in agriculture that made it possible for landowners to uh, grow more food without having to employ so many people. Uh, that was a big uh, big change because you know these landowners realized that they could get away with not paying so many wages they just buy a machine to do all the work or whatever was going on and they uh, they decided to buy the machine rather than keeping the people employed uh, they were saving money they were making more profits and they were happier um, so where did these uh, agricultural workers go well they had no choice but to go to the cities looking for jobs in the factories or go to the mines um, Plots of land that son inherited from fathers became smaller and smaller. Um, basically, if a man held 100 acres and he had four sons, he'd give each one 25 acres. Now, one of those sons with the 25 acres might have five sons. Now he gives each son five acres when he dies. Uh, one of those sons has five sons. Uh, now that five acres turns into one acre per person. And then that person has three sons, and you kind of get the idea. Uh, it keeps whittling down and down. So... Uh, people were not inheriting as much land anymore and they weren't inheriting enough land to uh, basically run family farms so some of these farms had to be consolidated and the younger siblings would often be left out in the cold so they had to go to the cities to find work. A greater mobility of capital motivated the creation of the Bank of England. Uh, liquid assets essentially. Cash became king, uh, wealth was no longer concentrated in land, uh, wealth was concentrated in money and so you had that and that caused um, capital investment that caused people to be able to say hey I have this money burning a hole in my pocket I will invest in a factory and I will uh, open up a business so this industrial revolution was really the beginning of the business climate that we know today where people invest lots of money in the hopes that uh, they will be able to open a business that will cause mass profits all right improvements in textile production turned the college industry into a factory industry uh, textiles was really the first factories uh, they were called mills essentially. So these textile mills were the beginnings of the factories that we see today. England had an abundance of coal which could be used to power factories. Uh, coal was, you know, they had so much of it they could burn the coal to uh, run the machinery or create the electricity needed to run the machinery uh, throughout the mills. Um, now the downside to coal of course was that it's very polluting. So these factories would burn coal in mass quantities and then people would breathe in the coal and they'd get all kinds of illnesses from that. But that coal, which was readily available in England and not so readily available in other countries, caused England to be at the forefront of industrialization. All right, um, improvements in metalworking created better tools and machines. Uh, things were not made out of bronze anymore. They were made out of steel. That was a big improvement. 
Uh, the steam engine made the textile mills more efficient. Uh, railways. Railways are an important part of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, around 1800, there were no railways across England as far as I know. By 1850, there were so many railways across England that uh, somebody once made a map of all the railways across England and you wouldn't have thought there was any land that was not covered by railroad tracks. That, that was um, a big uh, innovation. And what makes it even more innovative is the fact that now if somebody produces a, sh a bunch of shirts, they didn't have to sell them in their hometown anymore. Now, thanks to the railroads, they were able to move them to the next town, and maybe three towns or four towns over, or down or up or whatever. So, uh, the railways uh, made it possible for people to make mass quantities of goods and then sell them all over England, not just in their hometown. So that uh, created a need to for more production, which created a need for more jobs and so on and so forth. And then the attitude of free market capitalism motivated England's economy. Everybody uh, bought into the capitalism and said, hey, if uh, you build a better mousetrap, you should be allowed to get rich, and therefore people started building better mousetraps, or shirts, or shoes, or whatever you want to think of. So that all caused the Industrial Revolution. And if any one of those factors is missing, there might not have been an Industrial Revolution. But this perfect storm really uh, brought England to the forefront. All right, Chartism. I bring up Chartism because it is mentioned several times in the novel that John Barton is a Chartist. So if you've read the novel already and you've seen him being called a Chartist, you might not know what that means. Or if you're about to read it and you're going you're gonna to see him called a Chartist, then you need to know what it means. Um, Chartism was essentially the forerunner to today's uh, labor unions. It was the forerunner to uh, labor legislation uh, uh, and so on. So um, it started with a charter called the People's Charter in 1838. Uh, which was written by a bunch of people, but William Lovett is credited as the main author. Um, but there were six main demands, and we're going to go ahead and read those out. Uh, every man should be allowed to vote, not just those that own property. Um, there was a law that said if you did not own so many acres of property, you could not vote. Uh, and the charter people said, well, what about the factory hands, or what about the people that, you know, uh, have a voice and have an opinion and have some intelligence, they just don't own any land. Um, they wanted every man to get a vote. Uh, equal electoral districts. Uh, the best way to illustrate this is imagine uh, we have a Senate going on in, say, Washington, D.C., or even in Atlanta. And Atlanta, with its three or four million people, uh, had one senator that could give one vote. Or let's, let's call it a parliamentarian since we're talking about England. So a city with three or four million, like Atlanta, has a parliamentarian that can cast one vote. Now, Picture, if you will, Smithville up in northern Lee County, which I don't know how many people live in Smithville, but I'm pretty sure it's not in the millions. It might not even be in the thousands for all I know. Um, and that senator has one vote. And those two votes could cancel each other out, even though the man from Atlanta is representing the interests of more people. So uh, what the Chartists wanted was electoral districts drawn up, uh, not in a gerrymandered way, but drawn up in such a way that about the same number of people lived in each district and as a result all the votes would uh, count for about the same number of people. Alright, abolition with the requirement that members of parliament be property owners. Uh, not only did one have to be a property owner to vote, one also had to be a property owner to even own prop to, uh, I'm sorry, to hold a seat in parliament to begin with. Uh, the People's Charter said, hey wait, uh, just because somebody doesn't own 50 acres of land does not necessarily mean they shouldn't be allowed to run for parliament and serve people. And then for those that might be poor and get into parliament, there should have been a, a salary for that, a payment for parliamentarians. Uh, parliamentarians prior to this worked for free. They, they had their own businesses, they had their own farms, they had their own whatever. So when they went to England, they did not have any kind of income while they are in England. They basically served the people or served you know, the government. So the People's Charter said, hey, give them a salary. Uh, annual general elections. And the reason that uh, the Chartists wanted people to run every single year was because of the fact that uh, they are worried about corruption. They are worried if somebody was able to have a six-year term or a ten-year term, uh, they could take bribes, they could you know, do whatever the heck they wanted to and not have any consequences. But if they had to run for election every year, that would reduce the corruption in government. 
And the secret ballot voting during Parliament session. So instead of everybody saying, okay, I vote this way, they wanted people to be able to secretly cast ballots. Um, so we go on to the next slide. Uh, these charter pe Chartist people uh, went up to Parliament on three different occasions to air their grievances, and Parliament said, we're not going to listen to anything you have to say. So the scene, uh, the chapters in Mary Barton, where John Barton goes all the way to London to speak to Parliament, only to be turned away, and he's very depressed when he gets back. That's based in fact. That really happened to the Chartists uh, on three different occasions. Uh, there was some violence between Chartists and the people that were against Chartism, particularly the rich folks. The most, uh, one of the most well-known being the Newport Uprising of 1830. And in 1830, 20 people died and 50 more were wounded when uh, Chartists decided to try and uh, move in and start their own government, essentially. And the British government said, nope, we're not going to have that. And so violence erupted. And most of the dead and wounded were actually Chartists. They were not on the other side. Um, in 1848, when Parliament refused for the third time to consider Chartist concerns, the movement basically faded into obscurity. It would take about another 10 or 12 years before it was completely gone, but essentially that was the final death knell. And then over a period of several decades, five of those six demands were met. The only one that was not met was the annual parliamentary elections. So if you go back a slide and look at those six demands, uh, the Chartists didn't get those changes made, but over a period of time, Five of those six changes did happen, and that's the way that Parliament uh, and the elections in England run today. All right, let's uh, move on to the next slide. All right, let's talk about the novel itself. It was published in 1848, as you can uh, see, it was right towards the end of the Chartist movement. It was Elizabeth Gaskell's first novel. It was kind of a uh, an announcement, hey, here I am. She would go on to publish several more novels. She would publish a... Uh, a, a biography of Charlotte Bronte. She would also publish several short stories. But this was her first novel. This was her coming out party, if you will. This was her announcing to the world, hey, I'm here to write novels. Here we are. Um, the original title was John Barton. Uh, Elizabeth Gaskell thought that John Barton was the main character in this story, and it was his story. Uh, the publisher said, no, we're not going to have a main character who's a chartist and who's a union organizer. Uh, therefore, you must name the story the novel after Mary, his daughter, not after John himself. Uh, Elizabeth Gaskell did not like that change, but she made it to get published because oftentimes an author will make whatever changes the publisher will ask for or demand, if that's the case, in order to get the publication done. This is a very unusual novel in that it changes gears about midway through. The first 17 chapters uh, are all about John Barton trying to secure rights for workers and about the love triangle between Mary uh, Barton, Harry Carson, and Jim Wilson. Uh, so basically for the first 17 chapters you're wondering how that love triangle is going to play out and how much success John Barton's going to have. Then all of a sudden, bam, there's a murder. Um, and uh, Harry Carson gets murdered and now Mary has to prove that Jim is innocent. And she goes on a quest to help prove his innocence. Especially since she knows who the murderer is. And how does she protect the murderer at the same time that she uh, is trying to prove Jim's innocence without actually ratting the murderer out. So there's uh, there's a big shift from love triangle and workers' rights to a murder mystery and a courtroom drama, if you will. All right, the main characters. Main character, Mary Barton. She's the title character. A beautiful young girl. She blossoms into a beautiful young lady. She does work as a dressmaker to help support herself and her father. Turns out she's a very bright young lady as well as beautiful. Uh, John Barton is her father. Uh, his wife and child die, I think, in the second chapter of the book. Uh, and by child, I mean his son uh, die in the second chapter of the book. That means that John and Mary is kind of like the us against the world kind of thing. Uh, he is a chartist. He's a union organizer uh, determined to help out the uh, workers of Manchester by any means necessary. Uh, Jim Wilson is a longtime friend of Mary. He's about four years older than she is. Uh, but he's madly in love with her. He has been since childhood. And he really uh, would love nothing more than to get married to Mary. Um, Harry Carson. He is the handsome young son of uh, uh, John Carson, I think it is. Uh, yeah, John Carson. He is a young man that Mary becomes very infatuated with. In fact, she dreams of marrying him so that she can 
use his money to help support her father, and then he won't have to work in mills anymore. Um, and that plays out uh, in a very in a way you might expect. John Carson, the wealthy mill owner, he's John Barton's employer for a little while. He's also main antagonist to John Barton. Uh, John Carson has no problems closing the mill or he'll put people out of work whenever necessary to help his bottom line. All right, George and Jane Wilson are Jim's parents, longtime friends of the Barton family. Margaret Jennings is an interesting character. She, she works as a dressmaker with uh, Mary, but she's going to end up having to become a singer because she's going blind. And so she takes singing lessons and becomes such a good singer that she ends up becoming a, uh, being able to make a living at it um, after she loses her eyesight. Her dad is Job, or I'm sorry, her granddad is Job, um, and he's also an insect collector. He basically has plenty of free time because he's retired now. He has a little bit of money put away, and so he basically collects bugs. Uh, Will Wilson is Jim's cousin uh, and a sailor who is going to play a major role in the story when we get to the courtroom drama. And then Esther. Uh, the story opens with the news of Esther's disappearance. Esther is Mary's, and by Mary, I mean uh, Mary, like the mother Mary, his, her sister. So basically, Mary Barton gives birth to a girl whose name is Mary Barton. So the daughter is the focus of the story. But the mom has a sister named Esther, who is uh, uh, the younger Mary's aunt. And... Uh, she basically disappears and causes all kinds of stress in Mary's mother, Mary. Um, and uh, we find out later that after the man that she ran off with basically dumped her, she had no choice but to turn to a life of prostitution. And this is highly unusual for 1848, for a prostitute to actually become a sympathetic character. Because prostitutes were fallen women, they were sinners, they were you know, tempting the men of the world into falling into their little traps and uh, essentially uh, essentially uh, that was not cool and so for Esther and Mary Barton to become a sympathetic character uh, was quite a risk on Elizabeth Gaskell's part and to some people it was quite quite the shock alright so what are the major themes in Mary Barton um, we're concentrating here on four of them uh, the first one is class conflict, and I think that's the most obvious. Um, the author throughout this book is going to have these editorials throughout saying that if only the rich uh, mill owners and their poor workers could just find common ground, we could save a lot of conflict and everybody could work for each other's best interests. The problem is nobody wants to work for everybody's best interests. Everybody, because it's human nature to be so, is selfish. So. Uh, the bourgeoisie, this bourgeoisie and proletariat come from Karl Marx. Uh, they are terms that he that he uh, coined. Uh, bourgeoisie, the rich employers are the ones that uh, own the mills. The proletariat are the workers that help run the mills. Uh, both sides need each other. Uh, the, the bourgeoisie needs the proletariat to make sure that the products get manufactured so they can sell them. Uh, somebody to run the machinery. The proletariat needs the bourgeoisie to give them jobs and to give them incomes and uh, basically this book has a lot of messages throughout why can't both sides get along uh, John Barton is a union uh, official and a member of the Chartist movement we've talked about that already uh, this makes him undesirable to a lot of mill owners particularly Carson uh, it's hard whenever you are working for workers rights and this is still true in the 21st century to a certain extent it's hard when you're working for the uh, benefit of the workers to actually find jobs sometimes um, you know, uh, the employers see you as troublemakers, they see you at, as a troublemaker, they see you as somebody who's undesirable, and John's going to run into that problem throughout the book. All right, John also firmly believes that only the poor take care of the poor in times of need, and the episode with Davenport is probably the best example of this. Uh, you know, Davenport gets sick, uh, he wants to go get uh, a, basically a license from uh, uh, Carson to get the man medical treatment. Carson does not give him the correct kind of license, and it doesn't matter anyway because by the time John gets back to gets back to Davenport, he's dead already. Uh, there are times when the poor people all put their money together to help pay for funeral expenses to to bury one of their own, if you will, while the poor simply uh, they live their high lives and they don't exactly 
uh, do a whole lot to help the, or I'm sorry, the rich live their high lives. They don't do a lot to help the poor out. The importance of judging other people based upon appearances. Our narrator is going to go through this time and again also. You know, there's a scene where John sees all the bright lights and the windows lit up in the shops uh, while he's starving because he doesn't have a job and he thinks that these rich people all uh, have it made because they have money. And uh, the narrator is going to make the point throughout that uh, people, uh, people are people regardless of whether they have money or not. And this becomes extremely important uh, when... Uh, John sees uh, Mr. Carson grieving for his son, uh, Harry, who has been murdered. Uh, the Union people turn to murderous violence when the factory owners won't give them to their demands. That's where Harry, Car Harry, Harry Carson gets murdered. It's actually basically something the Union does in order to try and get the attention of the rich mill owners. You, you don't want to give in to our demands. We're going to hurt you by taking your son away from you. All right. Forgiveness and redemption is a big theme in this uh, book. Uh, John Barton cannot forgive Esther because he blames her for his wife's death. He especially can't forgive her once he finds out she's a fallen woman. Uh, this is going to be a major issue for uh, for these characters throughout. Um, but despite her stature as a fallen woman, Esther does get her redemption in the end, pretty much on her deathbed, but she does get her redemption from Mary and Jim in the end. Uh, and then, of course, Jim is accused of murder, and he's going to go on trial for it. And so he gets his redemption when his name is cleared uh, with the help of Mary and with the help of his cousin Will. And then Mr. Carson, he's, once John Barton confesses to Mr. Carton that he's the murderer, that he's the one who killed Harry, Mr. Carson does not want to forgive him. Mr. Carson wants to have justice through any means necessary. And it's going to be his turning to the Bible and his finally forgiving of John that is going to probably pay, play the biggest role in this forgiveness and redemption theme. All right. Um, the, the next theme I want to look at is the nature of true love. And this plays into the love triangle uh, with uh, Mary, Harry, and Jim. Um, Jim is madly in love with Mary and has been ever since they were children. In fact, early on in the book, he steals a kiss from her and she slaps him in the cheek for it. Uh, but uh, it's because he's so madly in love with her. Uh, Jim has to win over uh, the approval of Mary's father. And that, you know, is a challenge for him. But he eventually does because Mary's father realizes that Jim's love for his daughter is true. And it's the right kind of love. Um, so... Mary, on the other hand, becomes infatuated with Harry Carson. And uh, it's because he's handsome, but also because he's rich. And Mary thinks that if she can just become Mrs. Harry Carson, she can uh, help take care of her father, and he won't have to work in the mills anymore. Um, what she learns later is that Harry's intentions are not as true as hers are. Now, Harry does find her beautiful, um, and you know he is interested in her, but he, you know, he'll confess at some point he doesn't want to marry her. So he basically wants to do you know, in, inappropriate acts for somebody that's not married. Um, so Jim's love for Mary is unconditional. Mary's going to hurt him time and again, and in the end, he's still going to be just as in love with her as before. And so that's going to weather all those storms. Mary's going to literally make herself sick in her efforts to save Jim from the gallows. Uh, in fact, she's actually going to end up in the home of a fellow sailor uh, trying to recover enough to go to the courtroom and testify. And then, of course, there's Mary's realization that Jim is the right man for her. It's a very coming-of-age moment for her. It's a moment of maturity. It's a moment where she grows up, if you will. So uh, once she realizes he's the right one, uh, now she's no longer a girl. She's a full-grown woman. And then we've got drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, for example, uh, Al uh, Esther turns to alcohol to drown her sorrows. She's had a rough life. She, her life did not turn out the way it was supposed to. Uh, how does she try to forget? She drinks herself into oblivion. So uh, she's got those problems. In fact, she will actually warn Mary against those vices, and she will think that she's not worthy because she is so addicted to the alcohol. John Barton's going to become addicted to opium. Opium was kind of the designer drug of his time. Uh, it was inexpensive. In fact, John Barton will sometimes take opium instead of eating food because the opium's cheaper. Um, it keeps him in a stupor. And it's a way for him to, you know, kill his sorrows as well. So 
that is the theme of drug and alcohol addiction. So that is Mary Barton in a nutshell. And I hope that uh, this video helps you understand it better. I hope you'll enjoy this story. It's got something for everybody, I think. And so it's worth reading. And uh, if you have any other further questions about the novel or about how to address in your papers, please feel free to contact me and I'll be glad to help you out.